Ladies and gentlemen, we are getting into our next session, and the session is on leadership, belief, hope, and trust. And for this session, I would like to invite one gentleman who has a cricketing link. The lineage that he has is with his father being a well-known Ranji Trophy player in 1950, and his mother being the first manageress of the Indian women's cricket team that played against Australia and England. Keshav Murugesh, the CEO of WNS Global Holding and a leading BPM company with 26,000 employees. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Keshav Murugesh to lead us through this session. Over to you. Are you ready? Ready. Ladies and gentlemen, wake up. This is that session where you're going to meet the superstar of the cricketing world. Widely hailed, I'm reading this out because I don't want to go wrong here. Widely hailed by critics as the greatest wicketkeeper batsman to have ever played the game, Adam Gilchrist lays claim to hitting the most sixes in test cricket, 100 to be precise. He is also regarded as an inspiring team player, taking over 400 dismissals in one-day internationals, as well as scoring over 8,699 runs at a phenomenal strike rate of almost 97 runs per 100 balls. To his millions of fans around the world, it is the way he plays the game, rather than simply the sum of his achievements, that marks him out as one of the best loved cricketers of this generation. He is both a swashbuckling batsman and record-breaking record wicketkeeper, yet perhaps his true impact has come from the manner in which he plays the game of cricket, with an integrity and sense for values that many had thought had departed the game forever. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to speaking to Adam Gilchrist, a legend. Gentlemen, please welcome the Brand Ambassador, University of Wollongong, Australia, Mr. Adam Gilchrist. All right. <laughs> welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me first start, Adam, before I put you on the stage and allow you to go ahead with your presentation. I want to quickly, in a minute, introduce NASCOM and this business to you. After Mahatma Gandhi and arguably Sachin Tendulkar, the one business that has put India firmly on the world map is this business. It's called the IT services and the business process uh, business. Interestingly, this business this year delivered $118 billion in revenue. It created employment for 3 million people in India. The people sitting here represent that 3 million kind of resources that work in this industry. And 33% of the people who work in this industry are women. Most importantly, we also have our own Bradman in the form of a guy called Mr. Narayan Murthy, wise, old, but somebody who created something huge. We also have our own Sachin Tendulkar, 
a guy who runs a company called Cognizant, Francisco de Souza. And currently, we have our own version of Mahindra Singh Dhoni in a guy called N. Chandra, the TCS CEO, you know, who is breaking every record <laughs> in the business. So you really have a lot to look up to from us as well. Look forward to your presentation. I'll over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keshav. That's a formidable lineup you've got there. Um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the uh, well. Thanks for the kind introduction and the and the warm welcome. Um, it is wonderful to be here today and be given the opportunity to uh, to address you and, and be part of such a um, prestigious uh, forum. Um, just very quickly on that welcome, I spoke to a few of you earlier uh, and I mentioned it's not always the way where I get a welcome like that, even in my own country. Um, I'll never take it for granted that everyone knows who I am. I was recently presenting at a, at a, um, a sponsors function in Adelaide in, uh, in South Australia and I had to fly over to Melbourne for a similar type day's activity the next day. And after a full-on day of meeting and greeting and handshakes and photos and autographs, I was in the Adelaide airport and I was just looking for that little bit of time that all doctors say that you need, a little bit of you time. Each day, it's healthy. Just have that little bit of time to yourself. So I was in the Adelaide airport in the bookshop and I was looking at the books and thinking, I'm just going to relax here. And I sensed a set of eyes on me over here. And I looked over and there's a guy standing there and I thought to myself, not now, but not now. No, go away. And I walked away and he followed me. And I turned back that way and he turned back. And it turned out he was a little bit hesitant to come up to me. He, he'd spotted me and, and here I was thinking, no, no, no. And finally he conjured up the courage to come over and he tapped me on the shoulder. And I turned around and I went, hey, mate, how are you going? He goes, oh, excuse me, are you Glenn McGrath? <laughs> Which I, I laughed too at the idiot, not, not that idiot, this idiot that thinks the whole world knows who I am. And I was too arrogant to even look at him. And I, nah. But I looked at him, I said, no, nah, mate, I'm not. And he, I thought he'd understand that he'd mixed up the teammates. He looked at me and went, oh, bugger, and walked off. <laughs> and I'm sort of chasing him going, no, 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 I'm, I'm guilty though, I'm guilty. But... So I do appreciate the... A warm welcome. It's always the case here in India, whether I've been coming um, indeed as a University of Wollongong ambassador or in, uh, playing in the IPL uh, or when I was playing against India for Australia. Funnily enough, even then it was always a very warm welcome. Uh, as it says on, on the screen there, University of Wollongong, uh, I've been a brand ambassador for that university for six years. It's a, a, a wonderful involvement that I'm very fortunate to have and it's one of my the proudest engagements or relationships that I've had, particularly post my cricket playing days. Uh, we, for six years, amongst a whole host of other areas that I do work with the university, uh, for six years we brought a delegation here to India with a, a strong focus on developing and fostering partnerships and relationships with Indian business, uh, with uh, research and development facilities and organisations, and we really do have a specific focus as a university on the IT sector. Uh, we, we produce annually the most IT graduates every year of all the Australian universities. So that is a, a speci specialty sort of niche that we focus on as a university. So to be here today in amongst, uh, as I say, such a prestigious forum is, is something that we're, we're thrilled and, and proud to be able to do. Um, the topic of the, the forum leadership, it made me think about perhaps trying to convey uh, to you some of the leadership messages that I was able to, to garner and, and learn along my journey, you know, predominantly from my cricketing life, but just life around and the personalities that you meet in general. Um, leadership for me is about, and it's, a, it, it's an easy sort of term to use, the term culture. Um, it can mean a lot of different things. But uh, in an organisation, I think culture is really important. It's up to the leaders to create and identify that culture. The, for me, the meaning is the values and practices shared by the members of the group. So often we talk about having a culture, but we don't articulate that to the people in our team. So it's really important as leaders, we have 
let all members of the team know exactly what it means. What are the values? What are the practices? That, what are our standards? What's acceptable? What's not acceptable? So it's the leaders that need to do that and, and the best way to form that culture is to create an environment that everyone wants to be a part of. It's like we all know, if you want to get up in the morning and go to work, you're halfway there, you're halfway to success. If you get up and you don't want to go to work, you just don't want to go and work in that team that you're a part of, it's going to be a really, really tough uphill battle. Some of the, the leaders that I was very fortunate to, to play under and learn from, there's two there in the form of Ricky Ponting and Steve Waugh. Mark Taylor was the first captain that I was a part of the Australian cricket team with. He was uh, captain of the 1997 <coughs> Ashes Tour. You know, that's, that's the tour that every Australian cricketer wants on your resume, a tour with the Australian team to England against the old traditional enemy. And I went on the 1997 tour and I knew I was 17th man out of 17 selected. That's what it was. I was reserve wicketkeeper, so I was going to be going over there, whatever Ian Healy needed, hit catches, polish his boots, whatever, run drinks, that was my job. I knew that. It was a learning experience for me. But Mark Taylor, at the start of that tour, he sat all of us down, as good leaders do, sit down and individually met with every player. And he basically said what his expectations were of me and of us as a group. But individually, he told me what he wanted me to do here, there and so on. And just by engaging with me in that manner and communicating so well, I walked out of that meeting feeling as important as Glenn McGrath or Shane Warne or Steve Waugh. He'd made me accountable, he'd given me responsibility and, and as I say, accountability for me to live up to those expectations of, of, that he had of me, even in my junior type role. Uh, the other leaders were a little bit different. Mark Taylor was a great communicator. Uh, Steve, he spoke a lot about attitude, which is something that I'll touch on very shortly. Uh, that was what a greatest uh, takeaway from him I got is about attitude. And Ricky was a bit of a blend of both, but really led by example. He was a, a worker who just got in and did the business and encouraged others to follow him just by following, you know, leading by example. Steve Waugh wrote this up on the, the whiteboard at the start of a tour of India in 2001. We'd been coming here for 31 years at that stage as an Australian cricket team without success. We hadn't won in a test series in India for 31 years. I tell you what, we found a lot of good reasons why. It was too hot, the condition, the ball spun too much, uh, the food was rubbish, it's not like home. We could come up with any excuse we wanted to blame the reason why. As, as a cricketing nation, we could, you know, we all get sick. Some guys were freaking out on the plane on the way over to India because they think pepper's hot, let alone chilli. So that, that we were, we, as a cricketing nation, we were happy to make up excuses as to why we were unsuccessful here. It had nothing to do with that we just weren't good enough. <laughs> we couldn't admit that. But Steve Waugh at the start of the tour in 2001 wrote that up on the, on the whiteboard in the first team meeting. And that's a, that's a fantastic quote that you can ask yourself every day when you wake up, how's your attitude going to be? How you think is how you feel, is how you'll act. And in a team environment, it is contagious and can have a huge effect on those around you. So I think part of being a good leader is instilling belief into your team. Steve Waugh sat me down after about 15 one-day internationals. As a batsman, I was batting down at seven, number seven, and wicket-keeping. We were playing in a final against South Africa and he said to me, right, we, we bowled first, South Africa got about 220 and we're sitting down having our lunch break and over a bowl of ice cream, Steve Waugh looked at me and said, Gilly, I want you to open the batting today. And I was 15 games into my international career, I'd never opened the batting, I was very, very comfortable at number seven, he said, I want you to open the batting today. And I said, yeah, 
you sure about that? I said, well, why? He said, because I believe you're the right man for the job. And this is one of my childhood heroes telling me he believes that I'm the right man for the job. Instantly, I was just excited by that and, and really, really pumped to get up and do it. You've got to give belief to those players. That belief and then the attitude, you know, c combined with the talent that I, I knew I, I had some talent, but it's gelling it all together. I took a great deal of belief from Steve Waugh simply backing me in that regard. I went out in that first innings opening the batting for Australia and I, I ran his brother out for a duck. <laughs> um, but we managed to open another 200 times together. So it worked out to be a decent partnership that we had going. But, uh, but it was a great installation of belief from Steve Waugh by simply telling me straight out, not we've got no one else to do it or the, the, the partnership that we've had going for the last six games has failed and we need to stop gap, you're the man for it. Trust as a leader. So important. And you mentioned this man in the, in the opening, Keshav. It's just so important. Wonderful story that's been relayed to me before about this man. Lady, a mother, concerned mother, takes her young son to see the ideological and political leader of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. She takes the son there, gets in front of him and says he's ill, he's, he's got issues with his health, his diet is really bad, he eats too much sugar. Please, sir, can you tell my son to stop eating sugar? At which point Gandhi says, ma'am, come and see me again in two weeks. So she leaves and comes back two weeks later and gets down in front of the great man and says, please, sir, can you tell my son to stop eating sugar? To which Gandhi replies, son, stop eating sugar. And a little bit perplexed and confused, the mother says, well, why didn't you say that two weeks ago? And Gandhi says, because two weeks ago I was eating sugar. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to empower people and encourage them to follow you on a journey, you've got to believe, they've got to believe unconditionally that you trust everything that you're asking them, asking of them. They've got to believe you and they've got to believe that you really do back what you're saying. Not just saying it out there because it sounds good. You've got to be committed unconditionally to what you're preaching, what you're in asking of those people to come with you on that journey. The third topic or theme I think important part of leadership is hope. There's another quote here that, that I've picked up along the way I think is fantastic. They say 40 days without food a human being can survive. That's apparently what it is. Three days without water we can survive Indeed, eight minutes without air, a human being can survive. But not for one second can any of us survive without hope. And that is the job of us as leaders, of people in charge of a team. There's got to be direction, there's got to be incentive, there's got to be light at the end of the tunnel. But above all else, there's got to be clarity in that communication. There's got to be hope for all of us, otherwise it's probably not worth fighting on for. So belief, trust and hope I think are v vital components of leading a group and taking them forward. As I mentioned about good leaders creating an environment everyone wants to be a part of. Somewhere where that's happened recently is uh, an I don't assume everyone's a cricket nut here, but I'll assume 99.9% .9 are because that's what I've <laughs> grown accustomed to in India. But, but I'll make a reference back to, and it's all very relevant or, or topical at the moment, the Indian Premier League. I know yesterday and today they've had the auctions of the players and, and uh, working out who's going to what team and so on. So it's very current. In the Indian Premier League, uh, Darren Lehman came on board and coached the team that I was a part of in the very first instalment of the IPL six years ago, 
and that was the Deccan Chargers out of Hyderabad. I'm sure there's a strong representation of people from Hyderabad here in amongst the forum. We started that tournament as the most favoured team in the tournament. Shane Warne's team started as the least favoured team. They were a bunch of old crockpots who couldn't play and led by a bloke that's retired and useless now. And of course, he wins the tournament and we came dead last. And I remember in that first IPL season, a lot of the talk around the teams and around the IPL was about that word I said at the start, culture, and understanding each other's culture. That was going to be one of the unique things about the IPL is all different nationalities coming together and we're going to learn about each other's culture. It's going to be great. I think we paid a lot of lip service to it, but we never really got down and did it. And we finished last and I think we had little segregated groups within our team and it just didn't gel right. The next, after the first year, year two, they, the owners asked me if I'd captain the team. I said, yep, I'll do it, but I want, there's a coach I'd like to get on board. And they said, who? And I said, Darren Lehman. And they all went, he's never coached in his life. He's an ex-player. I said, yeah, but I reckon he'd be pretty good at it. So thankfully they trusted my judgment and Darren came in and set about doing this. This is the first thing he set about doing. And before the first game of the next year's tournament, we had a day, not in the cricket nets, not running, you know, getting fit. It was, we had a cultural appreciation course. A facilitator came in and we sat down and we all got up and presented to each other about our backgrounds, where we're from, what is acceptable in our culture that may not be acceptable or may be offensive in another. And, and it was a really, really, it was a great day where we all learnt so much about each other. But at the end of it, we, we came together and ended up with a Deccan Chargers culture. And as I said right at the start, about the values and practices that we as a group were going to be accepting of. What is acceptable behaviour on and off the field and so on. And it was a really good way to, to bring that term culture together rather than just paying lip service to it. And I think Darren Lehman did a terrific job in that IPL2, we managed to raise the trophy and it was really on the back of that environment that everyone wanted to be a part of and was desperate to be a part of in understanding each other. Funnily enough, he's come in and done the same for the Australian cricket team in recent times. They were down and out. I joked earlier with some people that the last time an Australian test cricketer was over here was when they were here trying to win a test series and they lost 4-0. <laughs> and it's ironic that I'm here as an ambassador for a university, an educational facility, when in, in that series, four of our test cricketers were suspended for a game because they couldn't hand their homework in. So the irony of me here being spruiking education uh, is not lost on me, but, but it's, uh, Darren's created that environment in the Australian team and he's doing a wonderful job. And just in finishing, part of what I said about getting up and presenting to each other and creating that culture, we learnt to know each other. We learnt to know our teammates and I would encourage every one of you as leaders to know the people in your team, not just in their role at, the, at work, but as people. Know what are their likes and dislikes, what are their interests. Really, really forge a relationship that is a lot stronger than just what is it that you can contribute to the business or to the on-field game and that's it. And we did that really well in the Australian cricket team, we felt. And that man there on the screen is the legendary leg spinner Shane Warne. And I think all of us, well, it was pretty easy to know Warney well because you just had to pick up the front, back page, inside cover of the newspaper and there was a story on Warney somewhere. It wasn't necessarily always about cricket, in fact, rarely about cricket. <laughs> but what we learn about Warney, we knew him inside out. Warney loved to exaggerate. Warney's life was bigger and better and more bold than any of ours. We called him Hollywood. And here it would be Bollywood, for obvious reasons. It's everywhere, it's big, it's glitzy, it's glamorous, it's scandalous, it's, it's everything that Shane Warne is. <laughs> so, but we knew that Warney loved that. He loved to em embellish things and, and, and take stories to a different level just by just spending the truth a little bit if it sounded better. Because that's Warney. Now, I'll give you an example. We worked out, Warney, whenever he said a number or 
was talking about something that sounded more impressive if it was a larger number, say like an amount of money that he was being paid for something, whatever he said, we'd worked out that you halve it. <laughs> and that's much more accurate representation. And on the flip side of that, we worked out that if a number is more impressive if it's a lesser number, like a golf handicap, like Shane <laughs> says he plays off a handicap of five, you double it. He's not that good. It's ten. <laughs> And I'll show you just a little example of where we put this formula to work. Warney came downstairs to breakfast one morning in the West Indies, a cricket tour in the West Indies, and he came down and he was all dishevelled and his hair was everywhere and oh, the world's against me. And finally someone says, oh, what's up, Warney? He says, I've had 38 pairs of socks stolen on this cricket tour. And I'm thinking, I've never owned 38 pairs of socks. But... <laughs> I said, OK, how'd you get to that? He said, well... I started the tour with 50 brand new pairs of socks and he was sponsored by Nike or someone then and rather than packing out of his drawer, he used to just order up a big box of stuff and, and check that in. But he said, he, started, he said, I've just done a clean out of my bag as you do when you travel on the road, a repack, tidy up of the bag. He said, I've only got 12 pairs left. So I've had 38 pairs of socks stolen. I don't know if it's laundry service or housekeeping or... Teammates, so he starts blaming us. <laughs> so we sat back and we thought, well, better put this formula to work because this, this doesn't sound right. So he says he started with 50 pairs of socks. That's rubbish. Halve it, 25. <laughs> he says he's only got 12 left. Rubbish, double it, 24. He'd lost one <laughs> pair of socks. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to know your team. You've definitely got to know your team and it'll help with uh, that team culture. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. I look forward to engaging with you some questions. Thank you, Gilly. That was wonderful. And technically, we've actually finished our session, but you can see no one's going anywhere, right? Please sit down. I have a few questions for you. I've collected a few questions, actually, from a number of these people here and people outside this room, and I'm going to ask you just a few. Uh, and then we're going to go into a rapid fire round. Okay. okay? So let's start first with the Dusra. I know you guys in Australia oh, don't like that too those. much. But we're told that cricket was not something you were very interested in in the beginning. Is that right? Uh, no, that's not right. Great. That's why I call it the Dusra. <laughs> let's go to the next one then. Right? You had you and Warren, as well as you and McGrath, mm -hmm. right, hunted in packs like wolves. Tell us, you know, what are the rules of, you know, of a great kind of partnership that we can learn from as well in the world of business? Well, I think um, you're right. The, the, the highlight of my career was definitely uh, wicket-keeping to the two men that you, that, that you mentioned there, Glenn McGrath and Shane Warne. I mean, the theatre of Shane Warne was unbelievable. You'd, you'd squat, crouch down, you know, I'd be behind the stumps and Shane would be at the top of his mark and you could just see a young batsman would be on strike and Warner would just be at the top of his mark, just salivating, just, oh, and he'd be there. <laughs> but then you'd see Warney click in, they're right, this, this sort of psych him out mode. So Warney would wait, 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 and the batsman's waiting, waiting, and... Sort of, and all of a sudden the batsman it just gets the better of him so he pulls away to sort of say what's going on and just as he does that, Warney goes right and starts to walk in to bowl and then stops and goes, mate, what are you holding that play for? And then he you know, starts to sledge the batsman for being slow and then all of a sudden <laughs> the batsman's confused what's going on and so all that drama and theatre of Shane Warne was so entertaining and, and above all else he was the best ever at what he, at what he did by leg spin. Um, yeah, that, that combination, I, I remember right from the start, Ian Healy was brilliant to Shane Warne and I remember coming into the Australian team being a little bit nervous about that as wicketkeeper, thinking, how am I going to get to that standard? And I quickly realised I, I, I didn't need to try to be Ian Healy, I just needed to be the best I could be and, and learn what I could from Ian. And, and I went to Shane and said, look, I just need as much volume of wicketkeeping to you as possible. So Warney was brilliant. We worked up a really strong work ethic, a great relationship in training. He would always bowl a few extra at the end of me to get familiar with him and, and grow that partnership. So it was just 
I guess identifying in a, in a team environment and identifying that whilst you might have some sort of apprehension individually and you might have some sort of hurdle that you can see coming up or that you are trying to scramble or climb over, working with those people around you to, to get over that. You know, for, for Warney at that point even of his career, he didn't need to go out on a limb. I mean, he's his own man, but he, he wanted to see me progress and he knew the, the value of that partnership working. So I guess that's one thing that comes to mind is that um, utilising those around you, even though individually you might have some sort of apprehension. Fantastic. So lots of preparation and building trust with people around you. Yep. And, you know, you've always had a very non-controversial kind of a stance. You've, you know, I, I introduced you as the gentleman of the game, the gentleman of the game, things like that. You've got your bluff, haven't I? No, I never lie. I never lie. But having said that, there were many times that you probably felt very isolated in the dressing room, right? When you came back, having walked, in spite of the fact that the umpire probably said you were not out. How did it feel and how does it feel to be lonely at the top? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. I mean, the, the walking element, it's a unique thing in the game of cricket, whether you walk or don't walk. It's a, it's a rare sort of occasion in sport where you can bluff, if you're good enough to bluff, or, or you might not even have to do the bluffing. An umpire might miss something and everyone else knows about it except for that one umpire and you, everyone's happy for you to stand there and, and basically you know, cheat the system. You know, if you hit it and nick it, you know you've hit it, everyone else does, but the umpire doesn't because he hasn't seen it or heard it and everyone sort of accepts that, oh yeah, it's alright, he's, he's cheated, but that's cool, you can do that. I mean, think of other sports where that happened, no way. You know, the moment you even go close to bending the rules, you're in all sorts of trouble. Golf, the etiquette, an expectation there is amazing, the standards that are upheld in golf. But that, that's cricket, that's just one of the unique things about the game. It's an individual choice as to whether you walk or not. I felt that as players we needed to be a bit more accountable with the way we were handling certain things around the game, certain issues. Uh, we're great whingers, I said that before. We could, we could find a way to tell an umpire he cost us a game very easily. But rarely did we, when we'd received, a, you know, been on the benefit of a, of a decision that went in your favour, rarely did we go and say, thanks, mate, you won the game for us. <laughs> so we're good complainers, but we didn't want to have it go the other way. And I just felt one little thing is we can help improve the standing of umpiring by, on a decision like that, whether you've hit it or not, you take that out of their hands and just move on so there's no conjecture or, or doubt. But, um, but that's an individual thing. Being lonely at the top, that's... So, so as far as sitting in a change room after having walked off in a World Cup semi-final against Sri Lanka in 2003, I, I walked and after being given not out, I'd smashed it. I thought it was so obvious and I thought, oh, we better get off. So I went into the change room, sat down and there was silence. And everyone, one of the most often asked questions of me is, what did your team say to you when you walked in the World Cup semi? And I said, it's not what they did say, it's what they didn't say. <laughs> it was the <laughs> silence in the room, which you're always silent when someone gets out. Respectfully, you let them have five minutes of cooling down and then slowly the murmur talk starts up again and the music might come back on. After about 15 minutes, <laughs> still silent, and Ricky Ponting by this stage had gone in and been dismissed and come out, and he's sitting next to me and said, oh, Gilly, didn't you, hear, didn't you see the umpire give you not out? And I said, yeah, yeah. yeah silence again. <laughs> Wrong answer. But, um, but that was, as I say, Ricky always supported me, said it's an individual choice. Being lonely at the top, it's a real challenge. The loneliest place, it's such an irony. I was here, spoke about that 2001 tour. Steve Waugh wrote that about attitude and we didn't win that series. Many of you may remember. We won the first test. Smashed India in three days here at Wonketi Stadium. I got 100 off 80 balls. It was my first test in India and I thought, what have our blokes been doing for 31 years? <laughs> How easy is this? So I was flying, I was literally on top of the world. It was my 15th test match in a row that, from debut that, and we'd won all of them. Life couldn't get any better. And we went up to Calcutta and magical test match, the best test match I ever played in. And I got out first ball in both innings. 
<laughs> two golden ducks, a king pair they call it. I was the first ever Australian to, to be um, able to achieve that, so it's quite a, quite a good achievement. <laughs> um, and the second time, you know, without boring with detail, we bat, get 400, they get 180, we make them follow on and then VVS and Rahul Dravid just decide to ruin it and put on 500 and they get 600 heads. So we, we're batting for survival on the last day. Cut a long story short, I get out, LBW to Sachin Tendulkar and the crowd's pretty happy. Um, so there's 100,000 people in Eden Gardens there's, before I went into bat, a little uh, super came up on the screen saying estimated viewership in India at that time was 70 million. That's just in <laughs> India. And that's, that's probably what they think they might know of. That's not counting probably the, the 100 other million out there. Who knows what's going on around the world. I'm in a land of a billion people. And as I walked off after that second dismissal, you know, I'd wicket kept for three days straight watching Raul and VVS bat and I was exhausted mentally, physically. As I walked off there, I had this sort of out of body experience if you like. I'm not the most spiritual type person but I was up on one of the light towers at Eden Gardens looking down I could see the Indians celebrating in the team, the crowd going bananas, lighting things, smoke, haze. I knew I was in a land of a billion people and I was as lonely as I'd ever been. It was a really really unique feeling. I'd gone from the highest of highs the week before to being dismissed twice in two balls a week later and I was at rock bottom. And it was a, a really a, a contrast of emotions. But, and that's the roller coaster of a tour of India for me. I love it. It's such a roller coaster of emotions. But, but you always sleep well at night, right? Because you live your values and you walk the talk, something I think a lot of people here always do. Let's go to the next one then, the next question. Many of us in the world of business are quite guilty of just holding on to our positions. You know how it is in India, we call it holding on to the gaddi, the throne. Yep. Right? We become CEOs and we never plan for succession. We never want to get off the stage. I recall recently at the World Economic Forum, I was at a, at a panel like this and one of the you know, very well-known CEOs of one of the world's largest energy companies was talking about what a great company he had built and how many companies he had merged, what kind of team he had built. But when I asked him, I said, so who is your successor? He said, you know what, I've had a series of five successors, but no one is as good, of, good enough as me, <laughs> right? And, and he was 69 and he was still yeah. in the saddle. But you, you chose to walk, you know, off the stage when everyone was still asking why and not why not, right? So what actually drove that? Why did you do that? And, and you know, I have actually, and guys, if some of you see what John Buchanan wrote about that decision, you will shed tears, right? See it after this interview is over, but why did you do that? Uh, look, first and foremost, I, I'll never forget a, a great, one of our great Australian tennis players, a guy by the name of Pat Rafter, won um, US Open a couple of times. Um, I really admired him and, and he, he sort of retired out of nowhere when everyone thought he was in the prime of his career and I'll never forget that. I thought he just, he said he'd lost the desire to keep going and, and there was no point wrestling it or, or fighting it or dragging it out and I, I, that always rung sort of true in my mind. I dropped the catch off VVS Laxman's bat at Adelaide in 2008 uh, the night before, I'd been on the phone to my wife talking about the tour that was coming up to the West Indies in two months' time and when the family was going to come out. So I was fully planning to still be playing Test cricket for at least another you know, tw 12 months the night before this day. First day of the Adelaide Test match, catch comes through, very, very easy catch. Uh, not the first easy catch I dropped, but, but it was pretty easy. Uh, dropped it, I turned around and looked up at the replay screen. They only replay them about 50 times. Um, so I had a good chance to really analyse what went wrong and I just watched myself moving and I just felt like I was just that much behind where I needed to be and in, in you know, the image of me moving to try, I was just late on it and it just suddenly appeared that 
at training, I was, I was just not there 100% because I had other things I wanted. I had a young family, I had some business opportunities, I had a few ambassadorial roles and life was getting more busy and fulfilling and interesting but what it was doing was whilst I didn't dislike training but I was cutting it short and I just, I'd been, I realised I'd been wrestling this for about 12 months probably um, but it just, yeah, I just wasn't there. Someone once told me no matter where you are, be there. Focus 100% on whatever is in front of you at that time because no use, if I'm, if I'm facing a fast bowler, there's no use me worrying about the issues I've got at home with my family or the financial issues. Can't do anything about that. I've got to deal with what's there. When I'm at home and I'm with the kids or my wife, focus there. I can't think about my batting then. Be wherever you, wherever you are, be there. And it, it made me think, I haven't been at training. I haven't been where I've meant to be. I wonder why. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested slowly now in other things. So that for me, I didn't want to go then on a... I feel like physically I could have wrestled it and maybe got another 12 months out and, and not been a disgraceful standard, but I just... I'd, exactly what you said. I'd rather people saying why rather than in two years going, why hasn't he gone? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that I, I just... In an instant, I never bought into this whole you just suddenly realise when it's time to retire. But it did, it came like a lightning bolt. It came at 145 kilometres an hour off the edge of VVS's bat and I, <laughs> I should have taken it. Um, and that succession planning, the other thing too that really come to, to mind was Brad Haddon, was a, he was ripe for the picking to come in and be the keeper batsman for Australia. He, you know, if, if I went on another 12 months, he might have, someone might have leapfrogged him because, and he missed his chance and I think it was a perfect time. Of all the legends, hey, I'm naming myself a legend, of, of all the big <laughs> names that left that team in Shane Warne and Glenn McGrath and Matt Hayden uh, and now Ricky Ponting, the easiest position and the most seamless transition was fulfilling that keeper batsman role because Brad Haddon was ready right then. He was ripe to go. So that factored into my decision as well. That's fantastic. And you spoke about the family. You know, you've, you've been a guy who's always been under high pressure. You've obviously enjoyed what you've done, but high pressure, travel, different you know, kind of food, interacting with people from different kind of backgrounds all the time. So it's never been easy, right? Talk about work-life balance. How did you manage that? Uh, yes, I wouldn't say it's always been easy. It's been a lot of fun, though. I think that was the, the greatest thing for me was whenever it became demanding and difficult, and I guess that going back to that decision of when I pulled out, I realised that I couldn't do this. Whenever it became a challenge previously, I'd just take it back to, hang on, why do I do this? Fun. That's why I got into sport. That's why I got into a team sport. I love having teammates. I love that, you know, when I'm feeling the loneliest place on earth, eventually I can go and sidle up next to a teammate and talk about it and get it out and have them help pick me up. I love that I can hold a trophy and celebrate that success. You know, no more fulfilling feeling than sitting down as a team and plotting a course of action, working out what the plans are going to be and then implementing those plans and doing it successfully. It's, you know, the change rooms were the greatest memories that you have of your career is celebrating that success, commiserating when it didn't work. Uh, so taking it back to why you do it, and that was what probably my common denominator was, going back, okay, I'm sad that I'm missing my family on a tour, but hang on, it's, it's why I'm here, it's my job, it's my profession, and do I still love it and enjoy it? Yes, 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 okay. I can get over the sacrifice I'm making there for family or for other business opportunity. And again, getting back to my end result of retiring, I wasn't saying yes to all those questions I was asking myself. I have a lot more questions for you, but I'm just <laughs> going to quickly go so. into rapid-fire round so we wrap up in you know, three or four minutes. I'm happy. I don't want to keep, right? keep everyone away so, from the big dinner that they got planned tonight. <laughs> One word answers. Maybe you can you know, add a second word and you're going to get like 10 or 20 seconds for each. Your bum chum in the Australian team. Ricky Ponting. True legend in the world of cricket. Shame on. Core value that the world of cricket teaches you? Oh, I think integrity. 
crucial ingredient to keep a team together and to succeed? Environment. One thing that you would want to change in the game of cricket? Um, Wicket keepers should bowl. <laughs> Indian cricketer you admire the most? Sachin. Sa uh, just on Sachin, um, we, yeah, without doubt, the, the big three of my time, I think Shane Warne, Brian Lara and Sachin Tendulkar, and just the way of those three, the way Sachin handled, managed and carried out fame, fortune and expectation is just extraordinary, particularly in a land of such passionate cricket followers. It, it really was remarkable and um, you know, the other two have had their various issues here and there but they are true legends of the game and, but Sachin just seemed to find a way through just seamlessly and, and was a very, very impressive man to, to learn from. That's fantastic. We, we all love him as much as we all love you. Which bowler troubled you the most? Murley. Murley, okay. Yep. The Dusra or something else? Yep. Okay. I, I still to this day can't pick him. This I've one, got no idea. When in doubt, sweep. This one I know is going to be tough for you. Nastiest thing you've ever had to say to someone on the field? Nastiest thing I've ever had to, I've ever had to say to someone. Failed. You failed. You failed. Oh. You, you, okay. you missed. Too late. So Sorry. obviously he's a good man. Any Bollywood movie ready to be signed up like your friend Brett Lee? No, I'll leave that to Brett Lee. He's fine for Bollywood or, or my former IPL owner, Pretty Zinta. That's sort of her domain and so yeah, I won't go there. Favourite Hindi phrase and do you know the meaning? Tumbahut khup sarut ho. Wonderful. You don't have to explain that. Well done, well done. Favourite Indian food, Gilly? All of it. Perfect. Love it, love it. The hotter the better. Any steps taught by Preeti Zinta? Any steps? Dancing oh, no. steps? No, no. As a dancer, I'm a wonderful wicketkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how you answer this one. Sachin or Rahul? <laughs> oh. oh. Quick, 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 you failed. Gotta go, Sachin. Gotta go, Sachin. <laughs> okay. McGraw or Warning? Ooh, Warn. Just. Warn. Australia or IPL? <laughs> said, I said this before. What country am I? I mean, in your. Yeah, IPL. <laughs> IPL. Much better. Well done. Well <laughs> done, Gilly. You passed the test. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been Thank absolutely you. wonderful having you here on stage with us. Thank you. And everybody, Thank you. we've always spoken about his batting, his wicket keeping, but he has actually taken one whole wicket as well. And would you like to show us the step that you, you, know, you, you did when, oh, you won that, no. uh, when you got that wonderful wicket of Budgie? No, I, won't, I wouldn't want to inflict that on anyone. We'll, we'll forgive I, you. I, no. did, I did get Harbish and Singh out with my last ball in competitive cricket. It was a, quite a fulfilling feeling considering he got me out about 30 times. So. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful Thank having you here. Thank you all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I request uh, Keshav to please offer a token of our appreciation to Adam, please. Thank you. Oh. That's a nice picture as well. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you, gentlemen.